joining Craig Erlum. He's a Wanda market analyst here, uh, joining us to talk more about not just crypto, but what's going on broadly in the markets. But let's start with crypto, shall we, Craig? Um, the action that you have seen recently in Bitcoin in particular, um, what is that telling you? I, I know it feels to me like when it comes to Bitcoin, people pay more attention to technicals. Is that what you're watching as well? Especially when it's in the absence of much news flow. Sometimes it seems that every day there's a new Bitcoin related headline, something to talk about, something to get people excited, something to make people more pessimistic. That's not always the case. Sometimes we're kind of clutching at straws, trying to look for reasons to move these markets. But as we've seen so often, the markets move quite happily on their own. They don't necessarily need headlines. We look at the price action from the last uh, few weeks alone. It looked like we were pushing new lows. It looked like we were just looking at support levels being broken. Um, and there was an incredible amount of resilience in the markets, despite the fact that it looked like technical levels had been broken. And once it started to generate some upside, that momentum really kicked into a high gear. And all of a sudden, we were breaking 45,000, 48,000, 50,000. And it's just kept going since. And let's face it, the last few weeks, I don't think there's been any major headlines. Yes, the US has said we're not looking to ban crypto, but they weren't for quite a long period of time. Um, this was just a headline which generated it. Funnily enough, China wanting to ban crypto didn't have the same effect at a downside, partly again because it's been quite clear for some time that China's been very anti-crypto. But these markets do just sometimes uh, have an inkling and do sometimes just have momentum. And when we saw so much resilience at $40,000, it started to become increasingly clear that if we could break 45000 then there could be incredible upside momentum, and that's what we've seen. Well, Craig, <clears throat> if crypto's rise, or, or well, let's just lock in on Bitcoin, if that move higher has been pushed by not a lot of headlines, does that raise the case or just raise the likelihood that we're due for a correction here in the near term? Potentially, but uh, I mean, you look at the charts, for example, and that's all we really have to go off right now. And there just still seems to be plenty of momentum in the move. You look at some of the shorter term charts and potentially we're going to see uh, a little bit of profit taking around $60,000. But that all time high, it's just the, the, the temptation around these levels, the idea that we could be seeing Bitcoin breaking into new territory and the excitement that generates on its own. I think is going to be enough to potentially to see this rally continue. And as we've seen, when we see new levels being broken, when we see new highs being made, it can have a life of its own and we can start to see some extraordinary movements. But ultimately, as we've seen, that they this does work two ways. We see that you see Bitcoin smashing record highs, and then you can see it falling 50% over uh, not too long a period of time. So this is part of the excitement of Bitcoin. This is part of the reason why I think so many people want to be involved in it. It's not just a belief system. It's not just a, I know what Bitcoin is, I know what it can become. I think it's going to be something massive. For some people, I think the excitement is part of what is driving it. it definitely, Craig. Um, I, I'm also curious, you know, we sort of discuss frequently that there's not a regular consistent correlation between Bitcoin and other assets. However, I do mm. wonder when you see um, other assets decline, for example, if we see a sell off in equities to people then turn to Bitcoin and say, well, I've got to make it up and take some profits in Bitcoin if I'm losing money over here, because Bitcoin has been uh, at least over the past month or so has been a more successful asset. So, I mean, I think I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to people trying to um, compare Bitcoin with anything else. I've seen Bitcoin mm -hmm. called um, a risk asset. I've been seeing it called uh, Gold 2.0, a safe haven. I've seen it called an inflation hedge, a deflation hedge, and the list goes on. It seems to be that the environment tends to dictate why people are buying Bitcoin rather than looking at the reality of the situation. Um, I think we've got to wait a long time to decide what Bitcoin is and what it's going to be, if anything. Um, I think Bitcoin, quite often, it can move in line with some assets, but you do see those correlations break down quite quickly. Um, and I think people are too busy trying to pigeonhole it to try and... Um, to, because they want to compare it to something, it almost legitimizes it. If you say it's like gold, it gives it some legitimacy. I don't think it's like any of those things personally. Um, uh, and I think we need to kind of, I, I personally would prefer if we kind of move away and just start to look at its uniqueness and, uh, and stop trying to put it into a, into a bracket. Craig, big week for uh, stuff this week. Lots of data. I mean, we have the CPI report coming up. We have bank earnings kicking off tomorrow. What's the trade here? 
Well, I think these markets are really quite nervy at this point in time. But what, and a word I've already used during this interview when talking about Bitcoin, we're seeing incredible resilience. Um, the, the kind of FOMO chasing, the, uh, the buy the dip mentality that we've seen for such a long period of time, which quite often has been attributed to being central bank backed. Well, we're still seeing that incredible resistance in the market. We're seeing the word Tina being thrown around, like no alternative. Um, and because we're in such a low rate environment and because we're seeing uh, almost it feels like kind of bubbles all over the place. But we are seeing incredible resilience in the markets right now, despite the fact that um, we're seeing banks pulling back. We're seeing the Fed talking of tapering in November, the Bank of England raising interest rates before the end of this year and twice more by next summer. Uh, and the list uh, very much goes on. So we're seeing investor nerves tested here. So even though we're seeing this growing list of increasingly important downside risks forming in the markets, we are still seeing the markets hold up very well indeed. And I think this week is going to be really interesting once again. Like you say, we've got those data points. But for me, the key now is those earnings, because if these companies can knock it out of the park again this uh, this quarter, and it's not going to be as strong as the last, but if they can provide reassurance that central banks aren't the only one who are not overly concerned about the downside risks at this point. If companies can't tell us the same thing, they tell us that they think these risks uh, are transitory. If they tell us that they are still optimistic about the outlook, that can be the type of thing that gets investors back on board uh, once more. But as I say, I can't stress this enough. There are a large number of downside risks for the next couple of months. So I don't think we're necessarily going to see these markets surging high per se. I do think it is going to be volatile. I do think there's jitters are going to remain. Um, and we have to see out the next few months because... If we sell the next few months with these risks not necessarily materialising as they could, then the bullish case could very much return for these markets. But some of these could materialise, and that could be a downside risk for economic growth. Hey, Greg, just real quick, discuss for us a little bit the risk, uh, the downside risk of energy, because you're there in the UK where I know the uh, crisis, the energy crisis has been particularly acute there because you can't find enough people to drive the petrol around the country and get it to where it needs to be and the other types of fuel. Um, so how, how heavily do you think that that is weighing on investor sentiment right now? Yeah, we love a panic buy here in the UK. 12 months ago, it was toilet <laughs> rolls. This year, it's petrol. Um, the, I mean, the energy crisis in the UK is very unique. It's more severe than most because we're so reliant on energy coming from Norway, for example. We've seen disruptions to the, the flows from France where wind turbines have. We've seen uh, energy produced from there cut by around 50% because of low winds. Um, we have low storage limits compared to much lower storage limits, around 2% compared to uh, the rest of Europe and others. Uh, and this is just a few factors which have really fed in uh, into the, the issues that we have here in the UK and are going to continue to have. And the impact that it's had has been, I think, 12 or 13 energy companies at this point already going bust of the 80, that, uh, 70 or 80 that there were um, only six months ago. And I think these the, the issues are going to continue uh, to worsen over the coming months. We've already seen the government, for example, supporting things like the fertilizer industry in the near term uh, because of the knock on effects that can have into the food industry. Uh, and I think that's I think all in all, when you look at the impact that this is having now, there's a lot of talk about the steel industry, for example, because of these energy intensive uh, firms who are now leaning to, to, on the government and saying we need additional support. Otherwise, our operations are going to close and we're going to continue to pass these issues further down the line. The the UK and others have a big issue to deal with with regards to this energy crisis. And at this moment in time, it's hard to see how it's going to resolve itself. There are a few things that could happen. We need a warmer winter. I think that's one important thing. Mm -hmm. um, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is waiting approval from Russia to Germany. If that's approved, then that could alleviate some of the medium term pressures. It won't be fully functional straight away, but that could alleviate some medium term pressures. So there are a couple of things. I think OPEC could step things up as well. But I think ultimately it's going to be a very testing uh, winter uh, and we need to hope and on this occasion for some warm weather just to ease that pain a little bit. Well, I hope that you have plenty of petrol and toilet paper stored up, Craig. Craig Erlem of Olanda, good to catch up with you. Thanks for the time this morning.